Hi, I'm Andrew Dubber. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Now, there are people in the world where you can simply say the phrase, needs no introduction. Then there are those where it might be more accurate to say, is inadequately described by any introduction. It's kind of difficult to introduce someone like Nissan Sawney without missing something hugely significant. If you scan through his bio, you'll see Sting, Paul McCartney, the London Symphony Orchestra, Anushka Shankar, Andy Serkis, Nosrat Fatih Ali Khan, Four Hero, Quantic, Womad, Sadler's Wells, Imogen Heap, The Commonwealth Games, Fabric, Nora Jones, Brian Eno, Shakira, Horace Andy, Nike, Julian Lloyd Webber, Nelson Mandela, Telvin Singh... You'll see festival curator, newspaper columnist, radio presenter, theatre, Hollywood films, games, BBC nature documentaries, contemporary dance, comedy, influential DJ, jazz, classical, electronic, choral music. He's even been an animated children's television character as himself. He's a recipient of multiple honorary doctorates, countless awards, a CBE, which, if you're unfamiliar with the UK honours system, is the highest of the three Order of the British Empire honours. And in 2017, he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Ivan Novellas. But as impressive as all of this is, it's still not quite as impressive as the man himself. As you get to know him, you find out that Nitin Sawney is one of the most interesting, most thoughtful, most polymathic and erudite, and most human humans you might ever hope to meet. I was lucky enough to work with him on a brilliant cultural project some years back. We have stayed in touch, and he joined us at MTF Central in Ljubljana, Slovenia, back in 2015. And this week, Nitin was named as the new chair of the PRS Foundation, the UK's funding organisation for new music and talent development. Now, if you're listening on Friday 24th of April 2020, the day this episode comes out, he's performing live streaming online as part of PRS Lockdown at 6.30pm UK time. And his brand new album is going to be coming out very soon. So all of that seemed like a good reason to sit down and have a long overdue chat with the almost impossibly brilliant and it's Sony. Enjoy. Nathan Sawney, thanks so much for joining us for the MTF podcast today. Yeah, cool. Pleasure. Well, it's uh, been 10 years, I think, since we uh, first crossed paths. Can you believe that? Wow. Well, so 10 years since we did that Aftershock. Aftershock, yeah. So I want to just start by sort of setting the scene a little bit. Do you want to tell us what Aftershock was? So Aftershock came from um, an initial event at the Commonwealth Games where um, in Manchester, which was called Culture Shock, um, with Jeremy Davis and Deborah King, um, who'd, who'd organised this. And the idea was to, to get together people from quite diverse artistic backgrounds and to put them together on the stage, um, which was quite an ambitious idea in that, in that um, all those people may have very disparate kind of talents. And, uh, um, but it was really a celebration of diversity and eclecticism and um and genre breaking and and you know so the idea was really to to um to find a way of putting on a show which incorporated a lot of different talents um so you'd have rappers you'd have cellists you've you'd have um you know singers and drummers and but but people who who maybe came from different types of music as well so um and then putting on a show with all those people, which required a lot of thinking about how you find the glue and um, and how you really bind them together as a, as a band. And then we'd put on a performance at a given venue. Mm-hmm. So this is something we originally did in Manchester, and then we we did it in quite a few different places. And as you know, when you came with us, um, you know, we we then went around the you know in in lots of different uh, countries and actually performed it there. It's kind of weird thinking about that now, in retrospect, given the situation that we're in, this idea that you just bring lots of people together, go to different places. It seems so far away. Is this something that you think can happen again or we'd think about quite differently? Well, I mean, right now, I think it'd be an interesting idea to try and get into, I mean, um, you know, the the concept of of a... an isolation uh, aftershock would be really interesting because I, th- I think, um, you know, musicians really love jamming together, listening to each other. Um, artistic people, creative people love to experiment and to try new things and to and to see if they can learn from each other. So I think, um, I mean, you know all this with your with the whole hacking thing and how people like to like to take something that is 
um, is perceived in a certain way and then perceived in a new way altogether. And and I think that's something that Aftershock was very much about, you know, taking people who come from certain traditions or certain ways of looking at music and then uh, in a way kind of hacking into those and actually um, doing something totally different and um, and seeing how those skills could be utilised in a, in a new way. You, this whole idea of hybridity, putting different things together that don't ordinarily go together, that's kind of your signature a little bit. Do you like the word fusion? For me, I, I think of it as decontextualization because it's kind of like I'll take something and I'll I'll try to present it in a new context. Um, you know, it might be and and without diluting it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you um, sometimes when you when people think of fusion as well, they really kind of think in a very simple way of just sticking two things together or sticking a few things together, which I I'm not really into. And I think that comes from the word fusion itself, where um, you know, for me, I'm I'm much more interested in looking at first what what things have in common, and then finding the, the those commonalities by using emotion as a glue. So you kind of think about what theme, what kind of feeling, what mood you want to. Uh, get across first and communicate mm-hmm. and then you find um, the language of that together is any musical culture fair game I think so in um, as long as they are okay with it I mean you know for example um, I've worked with Aboriginal um, people in Australia where for example they weren't um, too happy about the idea of people outside their clan or outside their culture playing the yudaki which is also known as the didgeridoo um, uh-huh. they didn't feel uh, at times that that was appropriate. So you have to respect the people you're working with and w- what their feelings are. Um, you know, if they've come from a tradition, you can't just walk in there, you know, like some arrogant twat and just kind of, you know, try and take over their whole culture and um, and stamp your own authority on it. Right. You have to be right. sensitive and and thoughtful about the way in which you work with people. It's interesting to me because, I mean, you're you're of Indian heritage and you're um, British, and yet one of your sort of primary instruments, in fact, something you've been playing longest, is flamenco guitar. Where does that come from? Well, actually, uh, funny enough, it comes from India because because uh, um, it, it originated in Rajasthan with the Rajasthan uh, Rajasthani Gypsies, and I've many many times mentioned there's a great film about this by a uh, gypsy called uh, Tony Gatliff, um, and it's called Latu Drom, which in uh, Romani means safe journey, mm. and actually it traces the journey of the um, of the gypsies from uh, from Rajasthan into um, Turkey and Spain, and it really shows. How how those commonalities kind of, um, you know, are are very uh, are still very relevant now and, and can be very interesting musically. Um, you know, for example, even the origins of um, of flamenco dance, you can see that in the footwork of Kathak dancers from India. So Rajasthani, um, you know, I mean, the Rajasthani gypsies still use uh, castanets, for example, old castanets. So there are a lot of those commonalities. Paka de Luthier himself talked about them and, and worked with people like Ravi Shankar. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are are those commonalities um i mean i love looking for things like that as well you know sort of like finding finding these points of connection and it's something actually i'm writing about at the moment i'm, I'm writing a book on this um you know about those common meeting points between different cultures um particularly through art and music right when are we seeing that <laughs> when I've done it, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of like, I mean, it's quite handy in a way being in isolation because I am getting around to kind of looking at it a lot more than I probably would have done. I'm kind of thinking, you know, I'm kind of inspired by, uh, I was inspired slightly by, you know, the, the very well-known book by Yuval Harari, um, Sapiens, in that it's kind of, it's anecdotal. I mean, I want to base mine more in um, in in kind of um, historical information uh, and less in less in opinion because I think my opinion is probably not worth that much. But um, but I kind of I'm trying to find uh, common meeting points. I mean, there's some, been some great books that I've read in recent times as well. Um, the Great Animal Orchestra by Bernie Krause is a fantastic book that looks at natural connections. You know, um, in the geophony or the you know anthropophony. You know, there there are different ways in which um, you can find. Um, uh, sound in nature that is really interesting. And I, I kind of think, you know, all of that uh, history of how music originated um, goes back to, to, you know, to how animals um, listen to music and, and evolution itself. 
I think you've just kind of demonstrated why your opinion is probably of value, just that it's an informed opinion uh, and, and that you, you sort of have what I guess would be like a textbook definition of an inquisitive mind. I, I sort of reminded the, you did the um, Desert Island Discs and uh, of course you took a book Yeah. and the book was not about music specifically, <laughs> no, it, wasn't. it was about <laughs> something, it was, it was about um, uh, physics, it was about, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so the, the thing I guess that's of interest to me is where does that come from? Where does that sort of inquiring mind? Is it like your parents are particularly interested in the world around them or you were just sort of this naturally inquisitive child growing up? I think, I mean, in term, in relation to music, my dad had a very eclectic record collection with a lot of Cuban music, a lot of, I mean, music from all over the world, really. And my mum had an, uh, had a very, I mean, both of them had, a, had very inquiring minds. They loved mathematics. They loved science. They were really interested in the arts. My dad was a really good painter. Uh, my mum had been mm-hmm. a classical Indian dancer um, when she was young. So, so there was um, there was a lot of interest in science and the arts anyway, um, but I, I guess. Um you know, I, I think some of the books I used to get when I was a kid, I don't know if you remember them. They, they were these um, how and why books. I can't remember who published them, but um, okay. I love all this. You know, it's it's great when kids are surrounded by stuff that can, uh, that can uh, you know, satisfy their curiosity uh, when they're young, mm. because there'd be lots of books about space and all kinds of things. I'd, I'd kind of find them, you know, much more exciting than reading novels or, or reading um reading any kind of fiction i'd i'd be much more into these books that really expose the the wonders of the universe and and how how um alluring that could be you know and and so i i kind of um and and i think music for me was my interface with all of that you know it was it was a way of expressing i mean i remember when i was a kid listening to uh, david gilmore for example playing um uh, playing on uh, Shine On You Crazy Diamond and mm-hmm. and thinking how beautiful it was in relation to, to reading this stuff about space and listening to his guitar solo. And I always had those connections with visuals or imagination with music. So I never really thought of music as anything interesting to me in itself, although I, I loved studying the grammar of music. But I, I wanted to only study the grammar of music to express an idea or a feeling. And I think really that's... Um, yeah, that's something I felt very strongly about when I was a kid. Is it important to you to express the feeling or that other people hear that? I think it's more important for me to express it. So I, I think I talked to you before about, um, you know, the whole difference between communication and uh, and catharsis or expression. Yeah. And, and so as an artist, I think the first obligation in a way is to find your catharsis is to find what moves you and what you feel you need to express and and I talk about a need to express because for me music is at its best when it's when it comes from passion so if you if you feel passionately about something then I I honestly believe something beautiful will emerge when you immerse yourself in that passion and then you find the sounds and the feelings and the flavors within uh, within your hands and with in you know even your voice or however you express your music if you find all of that within it then something amazing will emerge whatever it is there's there's sort of no end of uh, lists of achievements that uh, you can sort of rack up Ivan Novello awards lifetime achievement awards i can't Five honorary doctorates. Is that it's six, right? six honorary doctorates. Six. Yes. Okay, so I missed one. Um, and and now you've taken on the role of the PRS Foundation chair. I mean, apart from uh, you know, is there anything left for you to go for? <laughs> what's what's the what's the ambition in regards to let's say the PRS Foundation? I mean, well, first of all, I'm not an ambitious person, as I've I think I've told you that as well before. Mm-hmm. I, I don't really feel um, strongly about. Um, wanting to achieve things but I, I'm very fortunate in that lovely things happen to me so um, with the PRS Foundation they're a fan, they're a great organisation I met ages ago I worked um, I was a judge for them for their new music award mm-hmm. um, and they are champions of, of new um, and innovative artists and that's one thing I really love about them so I was honoured that they asked me to, to chair and um, and I think that they are doing some great work at the moment I mean they're working Working with the PRS for Music um, organisation for uh, to, to create this emergency relief fund, which in fact we're we're going to be uh, doing a gig for on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know that's very important because right now musicians are really struggling, as you know. Um, you know, musicians now have very few sources of income, and streaming just doesn't cut it for musicians. I mean, you know, with now gigs actually being um, virtually impossible, um, apart from online. 
it's very hard for musicians to make a decent living. So I think it's important for um, organizations like PRS Foundation or, you know, PRS for Music to, to really be there to help out and to, to support young musicians who want to actually be heard and not, um, not really thought of in a commercial way. I mean, for example, the old commercial models that existed before record companies um, funding young musicians with development deals, that doesn't really exist anymore. And so, right. you know, I've, I've often said what happens to those young musicians who really need help and support in evolving their talent. I mean, you know, you could, you could have a young Mozart and uh, they would go unnoticed because what are they going to do? If there was an equivalent of someone like that, what would they do with their talent? Um, you know, I mean, to make a living, they may find themselves working in the commercial sector and creating music for adverts or films. Mm -hmm. But I mean, even then they have to get recognized and they've got to build a body of work. And so my point is, if you find if, if you have organizations like this that really look for and, and are platforms for young talent to emerge, I think that's very exciting. Mm. Uh, beyond how we can help musicians, how can musicians help in the current situation or how can music help? Well, I mean, music is a healing kind of thing for, from my point of view. Um, I was listening to Marianne Hobbs' show last night and she played um, actually a piece that I did with uh, Anushka Shankar for, for uh, Ravi Shankar's Centenary. And she played some beautiful music, I mean, very, which I found really soothing. And I'd been in a difficult mood all day um, because I'd, I just was getting frustrated with all of this. I mean, I'm, I'm um, kind of, I'm not, not technically in a high risk group, but I am asthmatic. And so I kind of, you know, I'm, I'm keeping myself pretty much in isolation. And so from that point of view, um, it's, it's great when you hear music that opens up your feelings in your mind like that. Mm -hmm. So um, music is, I mean, you know, there is, there is a lot of, you could get into the technical side of it. And, and um, you know, there are parts of the brain that respond literally in a, in a pleasurable way to, to music. And um, there's a part of the brain called oscillatory phase lock, which, um, which they find in chimpanzees as well, um, where they respond like we do to consonants and dissonance in different ways. So dissonant intervals in music actually create uh, unrest and, uh, and irritation. Um, so, um, you know, but whereas with the chimpanzees, they, they actually respond really well to consonant intervals. So Mozart, for example, would go down really well with a lot of chimpanzees because a lot of the intervals are consonant intervals. Um, so, so it's kind of, you know, it's, and, and that's to do with the ratios and so on. But I mean, it's kind of, it's very, um, you know, it's it's very soothing and very healing to listen to great music that you can empathise with. I mean, it's not just the technical side; it's also nostalgia. It's also you know, it evokes so much feeling in us. Where whereas in animals, primarily they're using music for survival, reproduction, and communication. We're using it in so many different nuanced ways to mm -hmm. actually really uh, enhance our moods. And in fact, I talked um, recently about, um, and I was talking to a psychologist. Um, uh, about um, the idea of EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And that, um, that in itself is about left, right, um, uh, I, I suppose, stimulation. So mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of the hemispheres of the brain and, and uh, it's alternating from, uh, in the way it works. And, and she was, um, my psychologist was saying even walking or running or playing the piano or doing anything where you use your hands in alternating ways can, can actually really enhance your mood and do a lot for working through uh, problems that you have in your life. Mm. So there are so many ways in which music, I think, can enhance our feelings and moods during a time when we're feeling isolated, confined and frustrated. Hmm. Is there anything in the brainwave entrainment side of of, uh, of that of, of you know putting your brainwaves in sync with the, the pulses around you? Well, I think I think there, that's what's going on with the MDR. I mean, it's very difficult to know exactly. The person who actually came up with it, uh, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she sadly passed away last year. But she um, she originally. Uh, noticed this with light through um, through foliage and trees when she was uh -huh. when she was taking a walk and it, she noticed that the the light
light was actually alternating and um and this is how it works is you know originally it was eye movement but it also works the same way with sound i mean if you have a pulse alternating between uh you know left and right with the headphones that that can be equally effective Mm. so um so there is a lot of uh, clinical data that actually backs this up and it has got very positive results um you know, so so I do think it's uh, it's really interesting, and I think music for me, you know, if you tap into some of that musically, I think it, it can really be quite interesting. Mm. One of the things that's really sort of obvious about your music, apart from it being, you know, incredibly technically proficient, is that you you do the emotional without doing the sentimental. Um, how do you distinguish those things, and how do you really kind of how do you how do you separate those things? I think that's a really good question, actually, Dubber. I mean, like you know, that's something I do feel sentimentality. You know, working for example a lot on documentaries. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're you're a documentary maker yourself, so you're always looking for. Um, ways in which you can uh you can find tonality mm. and feeling without being didactic so you don't want to go around uh, telling people what to feel or to think mm. you you want to try to evoke feelings in people um through sound but without uh, without necessarily imposing your own perspective on them and i think that's very important i think that is the difference between sentimentality where where you are actually being um allowing your own uh, feelings to take over the um, the, the elegance uh, and grace of the expression itself, and I think um, I think you know it, that's the same with personalities. I mean, I find that the people most interesting to me are those who are able to um, who are able to, I suppose, um, use their emotions to support other people. And I think music can can do that in the same way. If you become over sentimental, for some reason to me, it feels like selfish music as opposed to music that is shared with others. Hmm. Which is really interesting because you're a collaborator. Um, Is that kind of central to what you do or is it just sort of a byproduct of how you work? I mean, I love working on my own as well. I mean, I love um, I love playing piano and and guitar and and coming up with, you know, I'll write a lot of songs and music. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. Once I've done that, and like I was saying in the first place, everything comes from a personal catharsis, but then it's about sharing, mm-hmm. um, you know, and uh, and I, I think that is that's a real pleasurable aspect of making music is that you have the opportunity to communicate with others in a nonverbal way, you know, and, and uh, to find uh, those common meeting points. I mean, quite often I will start, however, you know, if I'm working with a musician, I'll start with um, a conversation. When I worked with um, Imogen Heap, you know, that was the thing when we did London Understand. Again, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but, you know, um, when we when we did London Understand, we, had, we, we created a ritual where we travelled around London by um, going to these different parts of it different uh, compass points of it and in and at different times of the day so we created this whole ritual and then from that we created a piece of music that used that ritual as the basis uh, so in a way it was kind of trying to create in a very short time span almost uh, a mini musical tradition so it was kind of like coming from activity and feelings and thoughts that meant that you were um, incorporating the day the day into the music itself. Hmm. I, I sort of see you looking around in the studio where you're at, I, and there's a lot of musical equipment there, a lot of gear. Are you a gearhead? Is, you know, what's your relationship with music technology? <laughs> I used to be more. I mean, I, my, my thing is everything in, in music should be functional. So, um, so I'm, I'm kind of, whatever I'm using, um, it has to have a high level of function. Um, so... I'm not really into anything that's kind of, you know, too indulgent. I mean, everything I have here, I mean, this is my, my, ro- my room in my house now. So my normal studio is in Brixton. We moved for lockdown just before lockdown. We moved everything here. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, I've, I've kind of got the bare essentials of what I need. I mean, there's a keyboard, there's a computer, there's a screen up there for if I'm doing film scoring. Um, I've, got my, I've got some of my guitars here. Um, you mm-hmm. know, which you can see around there. And then I've got, this is a Kemper, which is um, a unit for giving me lots of different types of sound on the electric guitar. And then underneath that, I've got an interface for, uh, which is an equivalent of a mixing desk. So it's kind of like, um, but that interface is with my main mixing desk, which is actually on the computer as well. So so all of that, and then microphone and, and so on. It's not, it's not, um, 
a very complicated setup, but it's a setup that really works and allows me to continue to do everything I need. Have you got any uh, gadgets that you're particularly fond of that, you know, apart from anything, you'd, you'd quite like to hang on to this one? Yeah, this iPhone that I'm using right now. <laughs> I think that's my main gadget, like most people. Right. But I think apart right. from that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess... Um, I've got my Roly at the at the studio at the moment. I haven't brought that okay. over. I don't know if you know about those, but those are yeah the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. so I love yeah. those. Those are really interesting, and I find that quite uh, quite a cool thing. And I use that with the with the iPad to kind of um, uh, you know through Bluetooth to kind of find um, interesting ways of of playing. Um, so I think of it more as a keyboard. Not uh, I mean. Mm, it's not even a normal keyboard, is it? I mean, because you no. can be very expressive with it and it's a yeah. very tactile instrument. Yeah, somebody described it to me once as a piano made out of a wetsuit. Uh, it's a it's bit like that. Of, That's actually yeah. a very good description. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously you've been using this to make new music and you've got, was it album number 11? Or at least studio album number 11. Be, you've got yeah, compilations as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also I think this is, yeah, I think this is, it might be actually album number 12, um, if you take Dystopian Dream, yeah, um, if, if you include 1-0. So 1-0 was done as a, as a direct to vinyl. Yeah, it was done yeah. direct to vinyl, which was a really interesting thing in itself. I mean, um, direct to vinyl means we recorded directly to vinyl as opposed to going through um, a desk. And Well, we get, went through a desk, but not a tape. We didn't, or, or any, uh, or a computer. We just went It wasn't mastered and then pressed. It was actually recorded onto the it vinyl. was recorded onto the vinyl so wow. direct onto that la- so the lacquer itself um you know you, you're actually using that as the recording medium and that's actually how people used to do it back in the day but everything right. then then needed to be pretty much one take so one zero is an album of live takes um and you know it was the first album that had been done that way in about 35 years so we did oh. that back in 2013 and um, that was a really, uh, it was a really enjoyable and interesting experience. So doing something which actually meant that you'd get into the mechanics of, uh, of, of the recording medium itself was, was, and that that would dictate how you played, I think was yeah. really interesting. So not counting that one. Oh, so counting that one. Yeah. Uh, you're on number 12 studio albums, not counting compilations and, uh, and remixes and so forth. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, this one, this um, album is called, um, is going to be called Immigrants. It's the first time I've actually released an album or will be releasing an album with a major. So um, a major record company. So before that, uh-huh. I was, um, I was the biggest company I've been signed to was V2, uh, which was the biggest independent company of that time. Um, but um, but since then I've been with Cooking Vinyl and a couple of others, but they're independent labels. Um, but this one is the first time I was I was very honoured that they. Um, I mean, I really like Sony Masterworks because they call themselves a genre fluid label, which I think is great. You know, it's a, that's that's very cool and that totally ties up with the way I think. So um, yeah. and they're very very open and very interested in what I do. And um, I think they're an amazing team and very intelligent team. Um, I was signed out in New York, but I, I obviously interact a lot more with the people in London. But the guys in New York are amazing as well. So it's a, it's a very uh, cool label and a label that I'm really proud to be with. Hmm. And so tell us a little bit about Immigrants. So, yeah, I mean, I wanted to make an album that, I mean, after all of the uh, incredible... Um, it's been it's been so depressing to hear how um how immigrants have been constantly attacked and scapegoated not just in the UK but across the world uh, for so long um you know and i think it's important to really celebrate the history of immigrants and how much they have contributed to societies i mean the net you know in economic terms alone you know the net benefit of immigrants is phenomenal to this country and to most countries but you know if you if you remove that just how much they enrich the culture and how much immigrants have you know it's weird that we think in terms of immigrants being separate to everything else because really you know every culture is dynamic we we can't think of a of any culture as being static when people do that cultures die anyway um mm. but you know if you're if you're looking i mean you know any great 
I mean, if you think of the Italian Renaissance, it benefited massively from the influx of, of different cultures and different ways of thinking, you know, and it came on the back end of the golden age, you know, of Islam. So you kind of look at how people benefit each other. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, even Alexander the Great, when he went over to India, um, there was a there was a great exchange that happened there. So you kind of there's there's always been these kind of historic moments, pivotal moments where cultures have really benefited from each other. And I think immigration is very much part of that. I mean, look at what's going on right now with coronavirus. I mean, you know, the, the people in the front line, 75 percent of the ones who would been dying are from, uh, you know, BAME uh, backgrounds. So mm -hmm. you're actually looking at a lot of um, a lot of people. I mean, it's always been that way, I guess. I mean, you know, if you think about um, if you think about the uh, Indian soldiers, the Sikh soldiers who died fighting for the British in in World War One, uh, you know, on the mm. poppy fields and so on in the trenches, um, you know, it's always been there's always been immigrants on the front line, and yet we're so you know countries are so lacking in gratitude. I mean, the, the best thing they've said to the people who are the immigrants who've stayed back and are, and are fighting for, um, you know, against coronavirus and all the rest of it, the best thing that they said so far, the kindest thing they've said is, oh, well, we'll let you stay for another year. You know, we'll, we'll extend your visa for another. I mean, what kind of mentality is that? So for me, I wanted to make this album and, and with this album, I've incorporated a lot of brilliant musicians and singers um, and traditions and ways of looking at music. So, um, you know, I've I've brought in um, some of the people I work with regularly. I mean, obviously, Nikki Wells and uh, Ashwin Srinivasan, um, Arif Dervish. Um, I have brought in a brilliant singer who's from the Cavalli tradition, Drew Singari. Um, I'm, I'm working with Nina Miranda, um, who worked on Beyond Skin, who's a Portuguese singer. Um, well, she sings in Portuguese, she's Brazilian. Um, working with um, uh, Aruba Red, who's, who's actually from a German descent. Um, so she's she's singing in German. I've got lots of different languages on this album. And uh, Natasha Atlas is going to appear again. Um, you know, but it's really you know even the music and the and the words themselves are very much a celebration i mean the first single was called down the road which is um which is an optimistic take on um on immigration and and you know the idea of uh, togetherness but i kind of it's interesting because somebody pointed out to me that the words are quite salient to what's going on now with covid and um and i think um in the same way this next track that we're going to be releasing as the next single you are is coming out on the 1st of may um and i first played it on a radio show that i take, took over for tom robinson uh last week um but it's coming out on the 1st of may and um and the lyrics i think for that are, are weirdly prescient um you know i didn't intend it to be that way but it kind of it's very odd because the lyrics actually really are they'd sound like what's going on now and i think there is um, there's something of a zeitgeist, um, you know, about how you sometimes work as an artist, um, you know, where you don't even realise you're tapping into something that's happening or is about to happen. Um, I, I don't understand that, but it can, you know, it's happened to me a great deal as as I've as we've talked about in the past, and I do find mm. that um, that I do find as a musician when you have these coincidences and and um, moments that kind of um that surprise you um with your own work you know in terms of how they can uh, how they can be representative of changes in society um it can it can be quite uh, quite surprising you know later on down the line when you're working on an album like this do you compartmentalize or, or sort of focus just on that or do you multitask because you do so many different things uh is it right now is my time for working on this album or that's just between these hours i'm doing that between those hours i'm doing something else i don't uh, i'm not so well organized as you are i know you're very well organized <laughs> but i um i don't i don't think um that way uh, very often i just tend to go with the flow so um you know i am working on some film scores I'm I'm working on one which is um which is a brilliant environmental film actually or it's a film made by an environmentalist which mm -hmm. is um 
it's set in the biosphere on Mars in the future. But the um, the writer um, was an environmental advisor to Barack Obama back in the day. And uh, I think it's a really interesting... It, it reminds me a bit of Winter's Bone, that, which was a brilliant film that I loved um, ages ago. And it's got a really great feel to it. And it's kind of about isolation, interestingly. Uh-huh. Um, the the, other, the uh, other thing I'm working on mainly at the moment is about the Italian or the Sicilian mafia, which is, um, which is a documentary series that I'm doing for Amazon, uh, uh, Amazon Prime, I think. And... Um, and then there's there's a few other projects that I'm about to start, but but right now, yeah, I mean my priority, I guess, is is the album. I mean, you know, I find myself working that more than anything else right now. Is there a project that you're hoping will fall in your lap someday? Is there a kind of a dream Nitin Sawney project that would uh, would just kind of tie all the threads together nicely? I think I'd love to work. Um, collaboratively with a with a director maybe where I actually kind of get to direct as well um some aspects of a film um where I can really kind of uh you know maybe find um a way of representing the historical journey of immigrants um around the world something like that would be incredible I mean recently I I had the fortune to meet the great director Asif Kapadia um who is a hero of mine I mean he's if people don't know him he um, he started with a short film. I remember. Well, I think he probably did loads of projects. But Amy Senna. Yeah. Well. Well. The first the first one I saw was was the Sheep Thief, and then okay. after that I saw um, I saw uh, the Warrior, which was with Irfan Khan, which is a beautiful uh, beautiful film and very uh, moving film. Um, and then he went into documentaries. I mean, obviously, yeah, there was Senna, Amy Maradona. You know. Yeah. Um, so he's made these great films. Um, but, you know, I'd love to work on his next project, whatever that might be, or work with him on something because he's someone I really admire. Right. Fantastic. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this uh, complexity of dealing with things. And there's a really good example of this. You turned down an OBE, but you accepted a CBE. And I, I thought your reasons for doing it were really, really interesting because you, you took a stand and, and you said, no, OBE is connected with the colonial past, but it, it disappointed my father and so in his honour, I accepted the CBE, when that, which is a higher honour, but when that was offered to him. So this sort of, it's not a hard and fast rule. It was a, a sort of a weighed, the world is a complicated place kind of response to that, which I really thought was really impressive. How did you think about that? And does that relate to how you think about other things? Yeah, I don't like being absolutist about things or, you know, or intransigent about anything. I, li- I like to think that I'm fluid thinking enough that I can adjust my you know my approach to stuff in different ways but having said that um you know it was um my dad passed away in 2013 yeah in 2013 so um you know that left a a big impression on me um I was there by his bedside for five days um holding his hand you know and uh, and swabbing his mouth you know during those five days and it was a very a uh, powerful experience to watch some someone close up pass away. Um, and I think um, the very fact that he had said that he really wanted me to take to, you know, he said you'd be, it'd be a sign of how far we've come, um, you know, if you took that and, uh, or it'd be a measure of how far we've come. And, and so the very fact that the CB was offered to me in the letter on my dad's birthday, you know, um, in 2017, uh, was it 2017? Yeah, and then 2018, I took it. Was it? Or no, it was last. It was last year. I'm going going crazy. Yeah. So 2018, he um, he had um, he'd said. Uh, I mean, so I I got sorry. I got the letter. I'm going crazy. I'm thinking about my dad right now. Um, so he'd said when when um, you know when I did turn down the OBE, he said, would you not take it for my birthday? So the very fact that it came on his birthday uh, hmm. for me actually you know was a was a big thing and um yeah it's it's hard for me to talk about in some ways but i think i think it's um you know i i think the whole idea i don't it's not something i wear on my sleeve the whole cb thing the word empire still bothers me like i said at the time i associate it with more with darth vader than anything kind of like <laughs> particularly um uh, prestigious or or, or something sure. that I, I value in that way but i i think i i like i also kind of had thought that somebody somewhere had put me up for this 
And Hmm. people had sat and considered whether I was worthy of getting something like that or not. And I think there is a certain arrogance in just saying, oh, I don't want that or whatever. Um, You know, so I, uh, you know, I also had thought about that since I turned down the OBE. Um, But yes, I do have a problem with the word empire. I don't understand the idea that literally a CB stands for, uh, which I find hilarious, actually, because it it also reminds me of Bill and Ted. Uh, It's commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. (laughs) Which I find hilarious because it's, yeah, I just combination of Bill and Ted and and Darth Vader that come to mind. (laughs) But, um, but, But yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing. It, I guess, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, the, at the moment, the people who really deserve honours are, are the doctors and the nurses um, who are fighting for their lives as well as ours, um, you know. And well, I th- pay first and, and maybe then honours. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, and, and PPE, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they need that stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, I kind of take everything with a pinch of salt in terms of me getting any kind of an honor or anything like that. I, mm. I, it's nice. And I really, I, I acknowledge it and I respect that people felt that they want to do that, which is, which is lovely. But at the same time, there are a lot of people who I know for sure definitely deserve a hell of a lot more than I do. It does open up a really interesting thread here though, because you're a very scientific thinker, but it does sort of admit the possibility of you being quite a spiritual person as well. What, what does? The, the idea that, that uh, as sort of a, as a, a commemorative thing for your father, that oh, there yeah. was a, sort of some, some significance that it fell on his birthday. Yeah, was, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, so the signs thing. Well, I mean, also coincidences and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, it's not like I'm superstitious or anything like that. But at the same time, um, I kind of, I suppose there are, there are ties with other ways of thinking that I, I mean, there's so much we don't understand in science. I mean, at the moment, um, if you take the... Um, uh, was it the Fraukiger Renner experiment, or you know, if you if you know about Schrödinger's cat, it's an extension of that thought thought experiment. Or if you take, um, uh, you know, now we realise that quantum entanglement isn't as Einstein said. It's not actually uh, the idea that there is. Um, pre-programmed kind of like information within uh, within the the bosons that you know, or photons, or anything that is entangled. Um, you have literally got. I mean, it's not communication, but you've literally got a situation where there is a system that can operate at any distance, uh, what what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. So you have all kinds of stuff that happens in this universe that is way beyond our understanding. Mm -hmm. And science just can't even touch it right now. I mean, you know, that that, the quantum entanglement itself disproves that the the, the speed of light um, is the is the speed limit of the universe. I mean, so which is which is a principle that so much science is based on. So it's kind of like, um, you know, if you if you just look at these basic things, um, it's very difficult for us to understand a lot. So sometimes I just go with my intuition and think, well, this is coming his birthday. I don't understand why I don't really try to fathom it. But for me, it feels appropriate to respond in this way. Nice. Subatomic empathy. There you go. <laughs> yeah, quite. Um, we had you at MTF in Slovenia, and I just realised that was five years ago, so it's about uh, we're overdue getting you back again. But one of the things that was really great about having you there was that there wasn't any boundary between the things that you got involved in. I mean, I remember in the hackathon, you were sitting there sort of cross-legged on the floor with a guitar and people were jamming. And so the, I, I guess the this idea about compartmentalisation and and how do you think about what you do? I mean, because you're, you're, I mean, you've done comedy, you've done academia, you've done, you know, music, you've done games you've done you know also you acted in hollywood films you know you, <laughs> and, uh, yeah i did have my one appearance yeah <laughs> yeah but but i mean so being nissan sawney must be a, a kind of an interesting endeavor <laughs> it's very difficult for me to be objective about that one Dub. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I guess that's probably right but but if there was somebody who was looking to you as somebody like as you sort of look at other people and go this is somebody i admire if somebody was looking at you admiring what would you say is sort of key to being more Nathan Sawney? 
Uh, well, being yourself is probably the, the biggest thing. So ironically, to be more me is actually to try as hard as you can to not let other people tell you who you should be. Mm. So I think I think always trying to find, um, follow the work, follow your passion and not your ego. I think that's very important. I mean, I'm, I always try to look for interesting work that stimulates me as a human being, but not not really, um, I'm not really interested in you know, pushing myself in, in any way as, as the centre of anything. I'm much more interested in um, finding work that I can really empathise with and find common commonality with and, uh, and get excited about and feel passionate about. And, and I think that's what, you know, that's what I'm always doing. And I think, and don't look back, you know, um, don't, don't kind of, well, you can look back, but, but, but always trying to be in the present with what you do as an artist and creatively try to find where you are right now rather than what you did then and try to reproduce it or what you might what you might be doing or anticipate what you might be doing in the future i mean ambition isn't interesting to me um being present-minded and uh and excited about the moment is is how i think Nathan, thanks so much for your time today thank you really appreciate it cheers good to see you that's Nitin Sawney, and that's the MTF Podcast. You can find Nitin online. He's at the Nitin Sawney on Twitter, and his website is nitinsawney.com. That's N-I-T-I-N-S-A-W-H-N-E-Y.com. I'm Dubber, at Dubber on Twitter, and you can find Music Tech Fest, or one word, on pretty much everything. The podcast comes out each week on a Friday, so you might want to subscribe. But uh, whatever you do, share, like, rate, review. Have a good week. I'll catch you next time. Stay safe. Cheers. 